Okay, um, first of all, thank you everybody for coming, and I would like to begin <coughs> by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Salish Nations. And second of all, um, to thank you for coming along to the uh, Vancouver Aquarium and Ocean Wise initiative tonight. Um, and can, this is all put together relatively last minute because everyone's schedules are really busy, so thank you so much for um, coming along. It's fantastic to see so many people here. Um, Sorry, that was me. <laughs> I'm a bit on edge. Yeah, I, I don't know if you can, though. Keep going, keep going. Anyway. Can you turn the fan? No. No. Sorry. Um, I'm afraid I think we've got to leave the fan on because I don't think we have... We can turn it off right now. Anyway. Um, Okay, yeah, so thanks so much for coming along, and um, for those of you that might not know me, um, my name's Ruth Sharp, and I'm Public Programs Manager here at the Vancouver Aquarium, so I'm in charge of primarily all the adult education evenings and events, such as this one that we put on, and um, for those of you who are perhaps new to OceanWise, or have only been here once or twice before, um, I'm just going to play a short video um, that's about what motivates us here at OceanWise. Of the ocean. I am an interpreter really of the ocean. I am a really big fan of the ocean. <laughs> I am a child of the ocean. I am a geek of the ocean. <laughs> I am a voice for the ocean. I am constantly amazed by the ocean. I am deeply moved by the ocean. I am mesmerized by the ocean. I am humbled in the presence of the ocean. I am extremely protective of the ocean. I am highly concerned for the ocean. I am a defender of the ocean. I am a guardian of the ocean. I am a diehard supporter of the ocean. I'm a fighter for the ocean. I'm truly appreciative of the ocean every moment of every day. I'm an advocate for all the animals in the ocean. I'm truly grateful for the ocean. I am here to protect the future of the ocean. We're all connected to the ocean. Let's be ocean wise. So just, um, I also wanted to let you know about a couple of upcoming events. Um, I run a monthly lecture series on the fourth Tuesday of every month. So the next one is in October, um, where um, Dr. Elisa Gerben from UBC is going to be talking about sea star wasting disease um, here in BC. And then in November, um, Matthew Watkins um, from OceanWise Research Group is going to be talking about some of the plastics research that we do here at OceanWise. And also, um, just to let you know if you didn't already, that the majority of um, the public programs, such as this one, are live streamed on the Vancouver Aquarium YouTube channel. So if you can't make it to an event but would still um, like to attend, even if you can't make it out here, you can watch the live stream and also watch it um, after the event on the YouTube channel. And so, yeah, that's why we've got the camera, and that is why when I come around with questions, we have a microphone so that the questions can be heard for anybody watching the video. Um, and also, yeah, to thank you as I said, for all coming, and um, as you know, this event is free, and I strive to make um, all the community education programs here free for anybody who wishes to come along and learn more about the ocean and what they can do to help um, conserve the world around us. Um, so 
that makes these events hopefully as accessible as they can be, um, or as accessible as possible, but obviously these events are not free to put on. So there's a donation box just outside. Any dollar or two that you have um, will really help us continue running programs like this in the future. So thank you very much. So um, with that in mind, we'll come to the reason that you're all here today, um, which is to talk about uh, the new movie and to meet some of the filmmakers for the Shark Water um, Extinction movie. So Shark Water Extinction um, is a thrilling action adventure journey that follows filmmaker Rob Stewart as he exposes the billion dollar illegal shark fin industry and the political corruption behind it. Uh, so he travels from West Africa, Spain, to Panama, Costa Rica, France, to California. Um, Stewart's third film dives into the often violent underworld of the pirate fishing trade. So I'm sure lots of you may have watched his um, first movie, Shark Water. Um, so this is the follow-up to that critically acclaimed movie. Um, if you do want to see um, Shark Water Extinction, it's playing tomorrow um, in the Vancouver International Film Festival um, at 6.30 p.m. and also on Sunday at 2 p.m. And then it opens in theatres uh, on the 19th of October. So I will now play the trailer for the movie. I met my first shark when I was nine. I saw it out of the corner of my eye. And the second it made eye contact with me, it freaked out. That whole experience removed all the fear I had. 15 years ago, I began a quest to save sharks from shark fin soup. We're killing up to 150 million sharks a year. How could this be happening? We're desired in the Costa Rican government now that we're making shark water too. Um, is shark finning still happening in Costa Rica? It's a billion dollar industry. There's mafia rings trying to exploit the resource. So we gotta watch our back. We have to be careful. There is very bad players. Cars pulled up behind ours. He looks close to region. Sharks are now renamed and fed to us. Pet food, livestock feed, and even in cosmetics. You know, we spent four years trying to figure out what the biggest environmental issues were, only to discover this in our own backyard. There's two Japanese geese. We gotta get up there and see. Are they shooting? Yeah. Yes. Let's go. Let's go. go, go, go. Five thirteen p.m. Watch standards at Sector Key West Command Center. Received a report of a missing diver. We depend on other species for survival. Removing sharks is removing part of the framework that allows life to exist on land. The only option I have is to not give up. We developed a distrust of humanity at times. We're trying to figure out how we're going to save ourselves. We still have a bright future if we want it. But we've got to do something now. Humanity's going to rise to the challenge of tackling this. It's going to be amazing to see. first shark when I was nine. Uh, so um, we're extremely lucky to have um, four people here to talk to you about this upcoming movie. So we have Brock Cowhill, who is a diver, an activist, and a friend of Rob's for over 10 years. Uh, she's traveled with Rob and the production team to Costa Rica, California, and the Bahamas. Um, an ardent conservationist and the founder of the Sea Change Agency, Brock acted as a jack of all trades, helping with logistic, um, shooting under the water, and appearing as well in the movie. Uh, Julian Anderson is a collaborator, founder of the nonprofit Shark Angels. Uh, she's a, a passionate grassroots activist and marketing consultant, 
Um, inspired by Sharkwater, Julie partnered with Rob to start United Conservationists, leading a free fin movement throughout the world to ban shark fin. Uh, Brian and Sandy Stewart are also here. Uh, so they're parents of filmmaker Rob Stewart, as well as producers of the movie. And for the past 19 months, they've devoted their lives to finishing um, Rob's documentary. So thank you so much for um, coming along. Um, so we'll hear from the panelists, um, and then we, they will answer questions that you may have. Um, I have a microphone that I will be coming to you um, for you to ask questions. So if I can just ask you, if you want to ask a question, when the previous person is asked, um, has finished asking their question and it's being answered, if you could put up your hand so I could find you so you're ready to um, have the microphone and ask your question as soon as the previous question's finished being answered. So with that, let's welcome the fantastic panellists. So, yeah, thank you again so much for making your way here um, today. And I guess we could start, if you could start by telling us a little bit more about yourselves and what um, has driven you to make this movie and a little bit about how the movie's been received. Because I think you've been to a few film festivals along the way and how um, the audience has um, received the movie. Thank you so much for having us and thank you so much for coming out. Is the sound getting out? Can you guys hear me? And th okay. And thank you, Ruth and Oceanwise and the Vancouver Aquarium for hosting this. Uh, we're so pleased to be out here and so excited. Rob actually loved Vancouver and did uh, quite a bit of work out here. Uh, so we're super happy to be here. We'll start off with uh, Julie and Brock. You can introduce yourselves. Why don't you start? Ladies Rob? first. Thank you. Um, my name's Julie Anderson. The last time I was here at the Vancouver Aquarium was with Rob, um, trying to make Vancouver fin-free. So it's definitely a very special place to all of us, including Rob. Um, I guess the question was, how did we get involved? <laughs> um, we got involved because of Rob. And if anybody, and I'm, I'm thinking some of you guys probably have met Rob, he was just the most amazing, passionate person. And I met him in New York City um, when Sharkwater was just launching 11 years ago. And in a theater similar to this, I waited until he was done taking questions and I went up to him. And at that point in time, I was an advertising executive and owned my own agency. And I just said, gosh, you know, I want to help you. And Rob just had this way about him where he just made you feel like he was going to change the world. And when you met him, you knew he absolutely was. So four days later, I was in Toronto reviewing a notebook full of information on how we were going to change the world, and that was 11 years ago. Three nonprofits, two movies, and dozens of countries later, it's just been an incredible whirlwind and just an amazing journey, thanks to Rob. Hi, my name's Brock, and um, as Julie says, when you met Rob, you knew he was going to change the world, and he did. And just today, as a matter of fact, uh, one of the scenes that you'll see in this film is Rob and I diving on drift nets off the shores of California. And this is an antiquated fishing practice of mile-long nets that catch everything in their wake. And Rob was living in California, and that's where I live as well. And we couldn't believe this was happening in our own backyard. It was <laughs> appalling. You know, as Californians, we kind of pride ourselves on being forward-thinking and hopefully stewards of the environment. But alas, this kind of stuff is still going on. Just today, the bill was signed into law, and the California drift net is now phased out completely and illegal in our waters. Yeah, it's massive. It's one of the best conservation victories I've seen in a long time, and it's due in large part to this courageous young man that you see on the screen. And, you know, it's one of the victories he has underneath his belt, but it's a huge one, and today is the day, so I really wanted to share that with you guys. And it's a, it's a good one that we'll, we'll continue to gain some momentum from as we go on. Thanks, Brox. It's, it's so heartwarming when something that you do uh, creates enough awareness out there in the, in the world, in California, that it actually makes a positive change like that. So we're just so happy about it. I'm Sandy Stewart. I'm Rob's mom. This is uh, Brian, Rob's dad. Um, after the accident, uh, we were really fortunate. The entire team stayed together to complete the film. 
but we did have to bring on additional people to help uh, finish it. It's been 19 months. Rob would have planned to have brought this out last year, exactly a year ago. Uh, and it did premiere at TIFF. We got a super, a super reception from it. Everybody was, uh, was really thrilled with the movie. I think you'll see something in there that uh, viewers haven't seen before. Uh, so thank you very much for coming out. It's at Vancouver tomorrow and in theaters on October the 19th. And uh, I'll pass it over to Brian. Yeah, I'm Brian. I'm, I'm the old man. Um, Rob was a unique kid. He uh, loved small creatures, especially water creatures from the age of about three months old. And uh, he told stories numerous times about how he started his love of fascination with the goldfish. And it grew into every kind of creature known to man in our house. So this uh, young man went on to change the world in so many ways. And the response we've had so far, we were in Halifax last week in Calgary. And the response everywhere has been overwhelmingly supportive. And I think the movie can help change the world in many, many ways. I think it's going to inform you about things that you, did, you weren't aware of. I think you might change your habits and change your buying practices. It's, uh, it could be really very, very impactful. And we hope that you and you know will go out and see it and bring your friends and uh, help champion more change. Does anyone have anything they'd like to ask right now? Hi. Uh, so big. Big thrill to have you guys here and to talk about the movie. We're, we're, my wife and I are huge fans of, of Rob's work. And uh, I just wanted to ask, um, so I'm a filmmaker myself, make a very different kind of movie than he does. I make uh, horror movies. <laughs> uh, but um, I'm wondering how you approached, when you realized that the film wasn't completed, but you, want, but you guys wanted to get this thing made, how did you approach uh, who would be the filmmakers to help and how, I mean, how do you even begin to have that conversation and, and figure out who the people are to, to bring this thing to fruition? We were pretty much in a state of shock to begin with. Um, and then as it all uh, started to settle down, what we needed to do first was look at what, what had been shot. And Rob shot uh, 400 hours of footage. You know, 6K was really, really detailed and, and specific. So he went through that to kind of catalog, you know, the scenes that he wanted, uh, you know, what was there. And the second thing was, you know, we had to go back and say, you know, how much of Rob is in there? Because often he wouldn't put himself in the film and he would do the voiceover at the end. So that was the second project. Uh, but he actually, I'll pass you over to Brian. He actually left detailed, detailed notes, which... Uh, yeah, what was interesting was then when we, we knew we had a lot of footage. We didn't know what, was, what the footage was, but we hired somebody to, to archive and go through it all. And then we realized what we really need to do is find the storyline. And Rob's computer was locked, and so was his iPad and his phones. And fortunately, we managed to get into his iPad, where he did tons and tons of notes and sketches. And he did story arcs for every scene he wanted to shoot. He had a very specific story arc and arc, pardon me. And he knew this, the shots he was trying to get. So we had all that detail. So by when we finally broke into it, we mirrored him into his iPad, which Apple said we couldn't do, but we did it somehow. And we got into it. It was like a Nirvana that we, now we have what we need. And then the question was, can we use his computer, his notes, and all the information he has, diagrams. And I don't know if you know something called mind mapping. Have you ever mind map? He mind mapped the movie to death. So there wasn't one thing that could happen in the movie that he didn't account for in the planning process. So we had all that information. Now the question is, how do we match that with the footage? And that was the challenge. And you know, quite honestly, Sandy and I talked to some of, I'll call them Canada's and North America's leading directors, because um, we didn't want a director to come in and make it their film. We wanted to tell Rob's story still and, to, and accomplish what Rob set out to do. And that was a big challenge, because people talked to us about, oh, how they saw it coming together, and without going through his notes, and they were telling us how to make the movie, and that wasn't what we wanted. So we found Nick Hector, who you may know. Nick's done 150 films, and Nick jumped in with both feet. And unbeknownst to us, when we first talked to Nick, Nick was Rob's first choice, and he wasn't available. And we didn't know that when we talked to Nick initially. And then I was going back through his notes, and I stumbled through one of the emails, and I'm going, Nick Hector, and I looked at the time, and it was 
Months before, they had exchanged an email saying, sorry, I couldn't help you in the project, but you know, let me know when you're starting your next project, and then the accident happened. So in some way, Rob guided us to Nick, I suppose, because that was really what happened, and Nick became, in some way, Rob. And Nick spent, went through all the footage, went through all the notes, and said, there's a film here. And that was a big relief. And then we did additional shoots. We, the, the crew, Brock and the crew, went out to Bahamas and Indonesia, a couple other places that did not make it in the movie. But they now give us additional sh footage and side stories to tell because all those locations were in Rob's notes. But if we had it done all those locations, it would have been a four and a half hour movie. We would have been gone with the wind times two, you know? And <laughs> Rob could have done that, but we couldn't have done it, okay? so. We think we will come back and tell more stories, and I think there's more stories to be told. So the story you're going to see when you see the movie is going to be, we accomplished what Rob set out to do, and we ended with an appropriate uh, tribute to Rob, I believe. Yeah? Is there any, another question? Um, I, have, I have a question um, about those of you that were involved in the actual shooting. Um, I'm just interested in kind of how it worked. Like, what was the day like? How did you get the footage? Was there anything um, like unusual problems that you had to overcome or things that were unexpectedly very easy that you thought might be difficult? Well, that's a great question, Ruth. And as Brian mentions, Rob is very meticulous in his detailing of how things were going to go down, but also at the same time, super connected to the universe. So strange things that were never planned for always did happen to come up with like, you know, a mafia guy following you around that you didn't prescribe, that you didn't think was going to be happening that day, or a very interesting shark that wanted to come up and snuggle you, or something along those lines. So you can't ever account for these kind of things, but those are the kind of things that make you at the end of the day, go back and recount what you were shooting on that particular day and kind of relish that you're involved in the process. So I always love looking at Robbie's notes as well and, and seeing how detailed and how specific he was about how he wanted to achieve things, but then also how magical he was and magnetic for amazing circumstances to happen right in front of our cameras. Questions? Well, I can keep asking them. <laughs> Hi. So um, uh, obviously, it's a huge honor for you guys to be here. But um, obviously, I'm sure we're all going to see the movie. And I just want to know, in each of your guys' opinions, what is the one take-home message that you want all of us to walk away with? the one message, I mean, obviously there's quite a few different ones, but I think the one message and the one message that Rob always would talk to people about was the fact that we all needed to do something, just anything, but get out there and do it. And Rob had a saying, and he used to say, you know, take your skill and your passion and smash them together and live a life of purpose. And that's exactly what he's done. And that's what he's inspired us to do as well. So if you walk out of that theater and sharks aren't your thing, well, okay. I mean, obviously, we don't understand why that would possibly be. But if they aren't, do something. Do something about something that you're passionate about. I think, you know, if all of us did one thing to make this world better than the way that we found it, imagine what this world would be like. And that kind of segues right into what I think is a major takeaway from this film is that one person can make a massive difference. And Rob proves that, you know, throughout time and throughout history. One dude providing his passion, applying it towards, you know, an immovable object and creating fantastic results. And I think throughout the film, that message of inspiration and of hope is woven in really intrinsically, as, as Ro only Robbie could really do. I mean, in most documentary films, you're given a whole lot of information, but perhaps not a whole lot of action that you can get involved in. Rob was really great at instigating revolution, and, and he's really uh, brilliant at providing inspiration for people to stand up and do something amazing. Any other questions? 
Rob was a uh, Rob was really optimistic, and one of the things that he wanted to do is show the beauty of the underwater world, so that people would fall in love with sharks. And I imagine everybody here, you know, loves the ocean world and the creatures underneath it. But there's so many people in the world that actually never get under the water. And if you could show the beauty and how cool they were, they would work to protect them. Uh, so when you see the movie, you know, carry the message on that uh, the underwater world is truly beautiful and worth protecting. I love the Vancouver Aquarium uh, uh, message that you put up first. It really, all of the feelings of those people in that message are probably in everybody here. Yeah, the one takeaway is uh, anybody can be a hero. And I, that's one of the messages Rob said to so many people his entire life is it wasn't him. He wasn't looking and trying to be a hero. He just wanted other people to get involved and be passionate and fight for something beautiful. And I think that's the message you walk away from the movie is anyone can do this. You don't have to have special skills. You have to have some passion. And if you have, be fortunate to have skills that match that passion and deliver a change, then God bless you. Aren't you lucky? But anybody can be a hero. Okay. Um, so I know that a lot of us here probably um, may, may work at the aquarium, myself included. I am a biologist in the fishes department, so elasmobranchs, stingrays in particular, are really close to my heart. My question is, I have not had the opportunity to be able to go out into the wild a lot, actually very little, um, to be able to swim with the sharks. What was it like being actually in the water with them? Um, try to paint a picture for someone like me and anyone else in this room who would just dream to be doing what you guys did. Well, I'll give you a quick side story. Rob got me to go swimming with sharks um, in the Bahamas once, and uh, I wasn't the most enthusiastic person at the time. Um, I was older than he was, and he was young. He was like, what, was he 16 or something like that? 20, maybe? And he said, okay, we're going to go swim with sharks. And I go along because everything he told me I should do, I sort of went along with and did it. So we get on the boat, and I'm on the boat maybe five minutes, and we get out, and we're in the middle of the ocean and he says okay let's get ready and two minutes later I'm ready no one else has got even got their dive suit I'm ready ready to go up with eager energy I'm re so he says all right go in so, or they didn't even say go in I just went in I don't know why but I jumped in the, in the bit of this chum down a line and there was had to be 20 30 sharks around me my heart's going a mile a minute and then all of a sudden this calm came over me because they were just checking me out. One would come this way, another one would go this way, and another one would go behind me. And they checked me out for, I don't know, two or three minutes. And then they just, they ignored me. They didn't think I was anything. That wasn't something they are going to eat. And it was the most fantastic experience of my life. I've never experienced anything like that ever, ever since, and nor may I ever experience again, because all of a sudden, this calm came over me, and these, these creatures were magnificent. And they were from probably three feet to about eight feet. And I had no idea what to expect. So if you ever want to do it, the one thing I'll tell you that Rob did do, why he was doing this movie, he also initiated a Swim with Sharks VR experience, which we're launching simultaneously with the movie. It'll be coming up to Vancouver and in different markets, mostly science centers, but we're going to try to get it in some theaters. So it's a full 3D VR interactive experience. You put on the goggles, and all of a sudden you jump in the water, and you're swimming with sharks. Because Rob believed since there's only six and a half million divers registered in the world today, and another 20 million snorkelers, that's less than one-tenth of one percent of the world's population will ever get in the water and see sharks the way he wants you to see them. So he developed this VR experience. It's going to be coming to museums and the science centers, places like that. We should probably put it in the aquarium out here, by the way. I haven't even thought of that. Yeah, we should definitely put it here. Um, yes. <laughs> but it's going to be a chance for anybody, a, a crippled child, can sit in a wheelchair, put the goggles on, and be swimming with sharks. And Rob had a belief this is the only way he's going to educate people, and people that are stuck behind a desk, not allowed to get out in the wild, will now be able to go in the water and swim and not get wet. So this is all coming, and this is part of Rob's dream, and we're going to realize that dream for him. Sharks are really cool to dive with, but uh, Julie and Brock probably have more interesting stories. <laughs> 
diving with sharks is definitely a privilege. Diving with Rob and sharks is just absolutely amazing and something I think we're both really grateful to have experienced. I mean, Rob was just incredible underwater with sharks. I mean, he was like one part Aquaman and one part shark whisperer. It was just amazing to see him interact with these creatures. Um, for me, I didn't grow up the way Rob did in terms of loving sharks, so I was terrified of them. I didn't want to meet a shark. I loved the water, but I did not ever, ever imagine myself to be a shark person. And then I met a shark for the first time, and it completely changed my world. It was an incredible experience. I was at about 15 feet by myself in Hawaii, and then suddenly, within arm's length of me, right next to me was a scalloped hammerhead shark. She was larger than I was, and I just... <gasps> Oh my gosh, so I almost swallowed my regulator, thought I was gonna die, looked into the shark's eyes, and at that moment I saw life, not death, and I just, everything switched, and then poof, she was gone. And I thought, oh my gosh, did that even happen? And I swam up, and my dad was like, yeah, it happened, I saw it. Um, and it was just the most amazing experience, and therein kind of started my journey, for sure. But to answer your question specifically, one of the things I think that you'll really appreciate about diving with sharks, particularly as a scientist, is you know, really kind of observing sharks and realizing that they aren't these mindless man-eaters, but instead they have unique behaviors and unique personalities. So it's not even specific to a species, but to an individual as well. And just you know, the abilities to you know, recognize one another and social structure and cognitive abilities, and I mean, being in the water with these creatures for hundreds of hours, you realize, wow, these are nothing like what they're portrayed to be. Yeah, like these guys say, uh, you know, swimming with sharks is the most exhilarating thing that you'll ever experience, but also the most calming. It's a, it's a really fantastic kind of opportunity to zero yourself in on the present moment because nothing else exists at that moment. You're right in the middle of these incredible creatures. And as you guys may know, they have you know, two extra sensory perceptions that then we are credited with as human beings. I, I think we as human beings have those as well. But one is called the ampullae of Lorenzini. They run across the front of their nose or their snout. And they can sense different pressures and electromagnetic pulses in the water. And they can feel things in a different way. And they also have these things called lateral lines that run down the side of their body that kind of act as extrasensory perception in, in, in a similar fashion in that they can feel things and as they move through and they can feel different kind of emotions coming out of different things. So if you're scared, for instance, like I always say, sharks are kind of a mirror of us. If you're scared, the shark is gonna act a little bit scared or freaked out. But if you're excited, like Rob would be or like these guys would be in the water, they're like, whoa, that's an unusual reaction. I'm kind of excited to see you too. So they come up and they start checking you out and they start swimming with you and then all of a sudden you're having a, a discussion with them and you learn a vocabulary. And over the amount of time that Robbie and I spent in the water together, we kind of had learned how to sense what they were saying to us and then sense in a way that we could speak back to them and then finally in a way we could communicate with each other. That's why I say human beings have this capacity as well. You can send an electromagnetic pulse to Julie and she'll be like, oh, shark at three o'clock, no problem. You know, it's, it's really interesting experience. And for someone that likes to research animal behavior, it's, it's an interesting thing to do a little bit of research on yourself whilst in the animal kingdom as well. In this very theater, they have something called uh, Sharks in 4D. So it sounds like the VR shark movie should be what they bring in next. Um, first and foremost, you guys, this must be so bittersweet, you know, considering the journey. Um, my hat's off. My heart's open to the journey that you've been on. Parents, good friends, colleagues, evolutionary, evolutionaries in arms. Um, I'm going to be at the movie tomorrow night. I, uh, I met Rob four years ago at Planet and Film. Uh, festival. We both uh, won awards, accepted awards that night. And um, so I kind of have two questions. Rob touched me so deeply my time at that festival four years ago. I saw him uh, speak after a screening of Sharkwater, and I actually had a chance to film him. Something electromagnetic pulse came out, and I pulled out my camera and I recorded Rob. And what he said that night actually changed me as a human being um, and has kind of shifted my course as a human, as a filmmaker, and um, as somebody who actually wants to continue kind of doing the work that Rob started. There's two things I want to ask about. The first thing is, 
Um, what's next after this? I know you're just beginning this journey. I know Rob spoke of this amazing seahorse, the pygmy seahorse story. That electrified me. Notes. Pardon? You got all his notes? Yeah. Um, he also talked about a TV series that I was trying to connect with him and collaborate with him on at the time, which unfortunately didn't happen. Um, so I want to know what's next. I know you're just beginning this, getting it out. But m more interestingly, I'm curious about why Rob circled back to shark water again. What came out in this information that prompted this movie? Because he went shark water, revolution, and then he came back to shark water. So there must have been some profound things that came out that demanded that he address this. So could you speak to the arc of coming back to shark water? That would be wonderful. That's a really good question because um, when Rob came to us and said he was going to do a follow-up to shark water, you know, we said, you know, why shark water? You know, why not revolution? Maybe the ocean acidification might be a more pressing issue. And he looked at me and he said, sharks don't have that much time. By the time we figure that one out, they'll all be gone. This way, if I can save them before then, they'll still be here by the time we figure that out. Uh, but he had, as you said, tons of projects. And I'll let Brian uh, speak to some of those. The shark one, the little seahorse one is amazing. Yeah, the pygmy seahorse. The, we, we have the poster. We have the. He did a whole color brochure on it and sales pitch, and we have all his notes. And that, that is definitely one of those projects we want to go to. But when we got into Rob's computer, the amazing thing was we found the one-year plan, the three-year plan, the five-year plan, the seven-year plan, the 10-year plan, the 15-year plan, the 20-year plan, the 35-year plan. He had a vision of how he's going to save mankind and save the world, and he was dedicated to doing that. And along with that, we found 12 other projects. And in the projects is a TV series. It's all, all the episodes are written out, uh, where he wanted to go, what he wanted to shoot, why he wanted to shoot it. So we know we have this plethora, and part of what we've, you know, we have a very big job to do right now with this film, and taking it up to the world where it's being shown at festivals all over the world over the next few months, and hopefully it'd be released theatrically, and we, it'll be released on Amazon next spring uh, worldwide, which is gonna be great. But I think the other thing is that with all the other projects, we know there's so many great stories we can tell, and so we've set up a foundation for Rob, um, because we know we can't just let it sit. So the foundation we're set up is the Robert Stewart Sharkwater Foundation, and that foundation is being structured solely to go and find filmmakers and people to help take those stories forward. So if you want to be a member of the team, let's talk. Um, these are team members. We've got some great cinematographers and great people on the team worldwide, people like Dave Handen and Andy Casagrandes and Sean Heinrichs and all these people that are stepping forward for us and saying, because they know Sandy and I aren't, aren't going to go and shoot this stuff. I mean, we were going to retire, but what he did, he left it with something else to do now, because we were about to retire. So our mission is to find film, make, filmmakers and assemble the teams that could take those stories forward and find the new stories that need to be told that Rob had an in, I don't know, this instinctive insight into, but he, he knew a lot of these places he wanted to go and tell these stories, and we're going to go tell them. That's the plan. So um, first of all, I wanted to thank you for what you do. And um, I think it's probably fair to say that uh, people who are here are converted. So um, it's great that you get the message out to everybody else. But the, for the people who are here or for myself, I was wondering what I could do, what we could do today in Vancouver. Um, I. All I've been able to sort of come up with is reviewing uh, shark fin menu shark items nine. on Yelp. I saw that um, right the corner. But of my eye. to me, that's not enough. Um, do you have any suggestions for me or for us? Yeah, Vancouver's actually been pretty active, or various parts of BC, in terms of banning shark fins. Um, Senator McDonald in Ottawa has put forth a shark fin importation ban. Uh, in that uh, almost went through its third reading just before they recessed for the summer. It'll be back um, on the table uh, probably sometime in the next week or two and hopefully it gets voted on. Um, it, it, 
the ideal is that you ban the importation and the sale and trade of shark fins totally. Uh, but they did look at all of the numbers and realized that, you know, all of our shark fins are imported so that that would actually shut down most of the trade. The U.S., um, both in the Senate and the House, both have bills before the, uh, their government. And there's several groups, including uh, World Wildlife and HSI and Oceana, that are going to be actively pushing those uh, forward. Uh, with new, yeah, that, new petitions, so uh, we'll try and get those out to everybody so that they can sign up. Um, Canada is actually the largest importer of shark fins outside of Asia, which is actually shocking considering the size of our population. So if we can get these bans put through. Um, and then, you know, as Rob said, it's, it's educating people. It's, it's whatever you can do to educate people. give away too much of the movie tomorrow, um, assuming all you guys are going to go. Um, but one of the things that was um, a very big passion of Rob's was creating um, entertainment that also was action oriented towards, you know, obviously making a difference and bringing about change. So in conjunction with shark water extinction, there's a campaign rolling out called Shark Free, not Fin Free, but Shark Free. Um, why Shark Free? Because uh, what you find in the movie and what Rob found and what we've all found and horrifyingly enough what I've even found in my own home as a shark conservationist is is that there are a lot of different uses for sharks that we're not necessarily aware of and unfortunately the burden is on the consumer to understand what shark is being used in and also what products that we're buying on a daily basis whether it's the food that we pe we feed our pets, whether it's you know the fertilizer we use in our plants, whether it's the lipstick, the foundations, the sunscreens, I mean the list goes on and on in terms of what products sharks are in. And so the campaign is called Shark Free and what it's about is helping consumers understand um, what products do actually contain shark. And I know some of you probably have also read that um, Oceana just came out with a study that more than 40% of the fish that Canadians eat is mislabeled. So there's 18 different names right now in English for shark that doesn't actually contain shark. So it's very possible that you're actually eating shark as well, whether it's in um, fish fingers, whether it's in surimi, which is imitation crab. So there's quite a few things that we're asking people to start really looking at and really looking at labels. And we've got a lot of information on sharkwater.com about how to do that. But what we want to do is continue that campaign and continue testing products and understanding what shark, it, what shark products basically what shark is in. And that's really where the passion is for this particular movie as well. So there's gonna be a lot more and we're really kind of in the early stages of the campaign. So if you're keen to get involved too, we definitely need a lot of help educating, building tools and helping consumers understand um, what contains shark and how to avoid it and how to go shark free. Yeah, one other thing that you can do to get involved is get in the water. You know, um, as Julie says, like, you vote with your dollars, but making sure that sharks are worth more alive than they are dead is one particular way. So if you're going to go on vacation this year, go with Brian and go jump down in the Bahamas and go swimming with sharks. Good idea. Yeah, one of the things that uh, is going to come out, if you're going to see the movie this weekend, uh, as Julie's mentioned, shark is turning up in so many products. Uh, one of the things shark turns up is in, in, in basically fish pellets and cattle feed. So now we're having pigs eating shark. We're having salmon farms feeding, being fed shark. Ecologically, this makes no sense. So, you know, we've got to look at this and say, this has got to stop. We've got to stop this sort of insane exploitation of the world's oldest apex predator because without them, we're going to lose the oceans. And we all know what happens. The oceans go down. We go shortly thereafter. So education, information, and talk to your friends about it. Talk to your associates. People are just not aware. And if they were aware, they'd make better choices. So when you pick up a can of cat food and you're feeding your cat, if it's a wet cat food, and it says white fish on the side, that's shark. Oceanic white fish is shark. So 50% of the pet food we tested contained shark. So at some point, just look at, you know, and you, I'm not saying don't feed your cat, but don't <laughs> feed them 
Sure. Say no to that. Just don't buy that product. Hi. Um, I don't want to be redundant, <laughs> but um, I was heavily involved with the shark fin free in Calgary. And so I was just kind of wondering, are you considering doing something similar in terms of like chapters, or is it going to be like individuals? P.S. We all love you so much. Thank you. It's like I paid you to say that. Um, absolutely. So, you know, the fin free movement was a real, it was basically a new thing in conservation, which is an open source movement. Rob created all the tools and put it out there for people to carry it forward. And Shark Free is the same exact way. So we're going to ask all of our fin free chapters to get active with Shark Free as well, for sure. Uh, hi, um, sorry that I have to read in this because English is not my first language. So, the extinction is a monster of many heads. Which one has to attack first? The governments of each, of each country? The culture of eating fins? The pirates who do this as a job and a way of life? Or the people who do not get involved because they don't know that this is a worldwide disgra disgrace and it's happening right now? I'm become from Mexico. And unfortunately, in Mexico, the people is doing nothing. And we have a lot of species on extinction right now. So the government is not involved at all. So which is the first head that we have to cut? That's a great question. And as you know, each one of those heads are vitally important to make real and lasting change happen. But from our experience and just what we saw, in fact, in California today, if the people have enough outcry about a certain subject matter, the government will listen. We have to get up in arms about these kind of things, and we have to demand that our government changes. And if we do that, then there'll be legislation put into place, and then it'll take some time for enforcement to keep, get put in place on the tail of that. But I think it begins with the people. It's got to be grassroots. There's no way that we can just change government from the top level. I think we've got to change it from our boots on the ground kind of perspective. And the power of film is an amazing thing. Just today, witnessing one of our great victories. I mean, I'm still in shock that this happened. I, this was a battle that is being waged for the last 15 years, but it wasn't until we agreed just last year to go out and film this and show it to the public that everybody said, I can't believe this is happening in California. We have to shut this down now. And we did. So. Yes, it will. And uh, it'll be uh, uh, dubbed in Spanish as well. I'm going to answer that again real quick. Um, and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about before, too, in terms of absolutely, it's at the grassroots people level, and media definitely plays a huge role in that. But I think also when it comes to why people are out there finning sharks or why people are out there killing sharks, it's because there's demand for it. So really, every time you spend money, you're voting with your dollars or your pesos. Um, and essentially, you know, you have the ability to bring about change by making the right decisions. And if you're not supporting industries that are, you know, basically raping our oceans and killing all of our super predators, then eventually there isn't going to be the demand for it. So from my perspective, too, I totally agree with Brock. It definitely starts at the consumer level. And unfortunately, the burden's on us to figure out exactly how and what we need to do and what contains shark and what we need to avoid as well. Yeah, what, the one thing that really is ironic is the fact there's no governing body that governs the open seas outside of the territorial boundaries of each country. It's the Wild West. They do what they want, when they want, how they want, as often as they want, as they want and it's totally unregulated. It was uh, Sandy and I went to Ottawa and testified before the Senate about the hearings about shark fin ban. And uh, during that conversation, we realized the our own fisheries department doesn't realize there's no governing body out there. They thought Interpol would monitor what was taken in illegally to various ports around the world. And that ignorance is astounding. Interpol has no boats. They don't go and patrol waters. They don't check ports. They don't do fish stock tallies. They don't investigate anything to do with fishing worldwide. They'll invest slavery, potentially. But even that's a, that's a crime, as you may have heard. There's a movie coming out called Ghost Ship about that. The ignorance is the, the single biggest problem. 
So educating consumers, educating the general public about what's going on out there is the only way this can ever be stopped. Governments will not do it. It's not economically viable for them to do the things we're asking them to do. So it's not a government issue, it's a consumer issue. Consumers have to create the change. And Rob believed in this world where we're so socially connected on, on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all these amazing ways to communicate. You gotta tell each other, tell your friends, tell your family, tell your cousins, tell your neighbors, tell anyone that will listen to you. We can create the change if we work together. But it only takes one of you to do it. So one person can become a, an army and I think that's what we have to do. So it isn't about government, it isn't about you know, getting legislation put through, it's getting consumers motivated for the change. Hi, as a scoop, over here, hi. Uh, as a scuba diver and an ocean pollution researcher here at OceanWise, whenever I go diving, I see a lot of nets everywhere, strewn around the bottom, animals caught in them. Uh, and I've seen in shark water when it originally released, there was a lot of net uh, issues. Uh, when you guys were filming this, did you see that there was a lot of nets in the water? Uh, and I'm just wondering, how bad was it? Yeah, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of derelict fishing gear left out in the waters these days. And uh, that's a whole issue, as you know, like of its own right. So we have a bunch of different organizations that work specifically on this task. Um, we need a whole lot more. You know, these, these nets are tremendously encumbering for everything that gets caught in their wake. And in fact, there's a particular rock in Mexico down off uh, the Pacific side, and there was a net that uncovered the entire underwater seamount, and with it took 15 dolphins, a whale, a whale shark, y you name it. It was a tremendous display of just neglect and tragedy. So pretty much anywhere you go, you can see ghost fishing gear. And it may not always be nets, but there's a lot of line to be found hung up in, in coral reef, yeah, long lines, different kind of deep set buoys, you know, a lot of floats and plastic debris. So this is an issue that we have to take care of. And it um, sounds like you're very passionate about that. I nominate you to go ahead and spear. <laughs> We went diving with Rob at, uh, in the north end of Madagascar in Nosy Bay, and uh, I think from that moment on, I don't think he dove without a dive knife. There were so many nets in the water that you could actually die getting tangled up in them. We've been really fortunate to be able to go to some pretty far-flung places like um, islands like Galapagos, Cocos, but also Mapello too, which is really, really far. How many miles away is it? 350, and it's really, I mean, it's not very well traveled at all. And I mean, we were finding fishing gear there as well. And actually, Team Sharkwater rescued some turtles as well. So yeah, um, that was great. One at a time, it was really, really awesome to do. But when you see the death and destruction and the nets and the lines everywhere, no matter where you go, no matter how far away you are, it's absolutely terrifying. Hi, thank you again for being here. Thank you so much for continuing Rob's work. Um, when he passed away, selfishly, I remember thinking, I'm so sad because who's gonna continue what Rob started? You know, I remember seeing the trailer to Sharkwater and just thinking, thank God, somebody is finally on this. So I have to thank you guys so much for continuing his work. It, it just, it means so much. Um, Sandy and Brian, I've read Rob's books and I loved reading all the stories that he told about when he was a kid and all the adventures that you guys took the kids on. And I just have to ask you, you know, we all know that Rob was a hero. You raised a hero. I think, I think everybody needs to know, how do you raise a hero? <laughs> we need more of them. And I just want to know as a, as, as a parent, like, what do you remember doing that you're like, oh, I, I'm really glad we did that. Like, what things do you think you did that influenced and changed who Rob was? Rob grew up with uh, tons of animals. We had cats and a dog, and, and he brought home all sorts of wildlife as well. And I think it's, and he was outside a lot. You know, we went to other places, and it was just respecting nature and cultures and, and the rest of the outside world. And I think maybe that uh, he just absorbed that. 
Yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's, there's something in him that was, you know, from the time he was really young, as I said before, he had a thing with water. He could walk around the bottom of the pool when nobody else could do it. When he was like four years old, he could, we had a, a, not too deep, maybe a six foot typical pool, but he had, at three feet tall would walk down the, and walk around the bottom. And you go, you can't do that. And he would do it. So this sort of unique kid always had this instinctive thing about water and animals. When we go down, we went to the Caribbean at, right after Christmas each year, when they were about from five on or so, and uh, the second we got down there, we'd be we'd be unpacking, and he'd be bringing a lizard in in one hand and a crab in the other hand, and he was five years old. Look what I caught! And he, you know, where how the hell did you get those? We haven't been there more than five minutes. <laughs> and this happened to the point that he'd bring home snakes and turtles, and, and I remember he got a gopher tortoise once and brought it into the screened in porch of the place we stayed in, and it was our pet for four days. You know, I mean, he was trying to find out, but he inhaled this stuff, he had an insatiable appetite. We were buying him uh, university textbooks when he was seven or eight or nine about marine biology and about creatures and about the oceans, and he knew more about that than any of the prep professors that he ended up studying with. He would just love that world, and I don't, I don't know if there's anything we did. I think you just sort of feed the passion and you know, we had an expression in the house, if, they, if they, they want to do it, you have to let them try to be the best they can be at it. And that was sort of the mindset we had. But yeah, he was my hero too. Um, he did stuff that I know no one else has ever done, and he, I'm, I'm so proud of him. And I miss him. Thank you for, thank you for that. Hi, um, my name is Brianna. I'm one of the registered veterinary technologists at the Marine Mammal Rescue Center. Um, and because of Rob's work, I uh, got heavily involved with educating myself on um, the ocean and wanting to actually help save the oceans as well. Um, so that's one of the big reasons why I actually applied and got the job at the Marine Mammal Rescue Center. Um, so it's one step in the door for me, which is awesome. Um, but I, when I talk to friends and um, just even strangers about you know, ocean conservation and I get the answer of, oh, well, I'm only one person, I can't make a difference. What would you have to say to somebody who says that besides wanting to smack them upside the head? <laughs> yeah, I think you nailed it right there with that part. You'd say BS, you know, like, look, there's several examples of incredible people that have stepped forward and done incredible things and one person can indeed make a difference just as you're doing just as rob shows us you know on the big screen behind us and and just as is happening in a lot of different environments and if they can't find inspiration to do so maybe you just give them a little instead of smack upside the head a little pat on the behind and say yeah you can you could do this get out there and give them a little spank I mean, I think Rock basically expressed it perfectly, which is, you know, we can't have apathy about it. If we all just throw up our hands and say, well, we can't do anything, then nothing's ever going to get done. And, you know, we saw Rob make a huge difference. And like Brian said, not everyone is going to have that skill set or have that ability to make change. But even small changes, right, even saying no to a straw and making sure, you know, that you're supporting legislation locally or you're you know, cleaning up your park, all of those things add up and make a difference. And I think that's the important thing. It's very easy to just kind of say, oh, you know, I can't make a difference, so I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. And that obviously is not the way to go. But I agree with you, Brock, you know, scolding and, and, and trying to, and I'm like the least favorite person at every party because I'm always talking about what's going on in the oceans and it's kind of doom and gloom. Um, but trying to put it in a light and trying to help people understand and that there is hope. And I think that's one of the most amazing things about Rob and Rob's movies, too, and Rob's movements is, is that you don't get that level of apathy or overwhelming, like, oh, my gosh, we're not going to be able to bring about change because there is change. And, you know, I would say to anyone who says, I can't make a change, look at what Brock just said. You know, this horrible industry going on in California, these drift nets. They went out there one night and filmed it, and I won't give away the, because it's in the movie, but some kind of serious stuff happened. But they just spent one night filming and turned over the film, and obviously there was a lot of other campaigning work that had to be done, but now that industry is completely shut down. 
And that's a perfect example of something that, you know, someone who grabbed a camera and a boat and ran out there and said, you know what, this is not something I'm going to tolerate, could do. So I would definitely say you can make a difference. And Brock is sitting here as an example, and Rob, and every single one, and you as well, you know? I mean, everyone can be a hero for the oceans, for sure. Something that actually works really well, too, is just showing people by example. We have people at our office that will not, you know, attend any group lunch if there's any plastic there. It has to be knives and forks, and, you know, if there's any paper used anywhere, it has to be recycled. And, you, you know, you live in BC here where the forests are really, really valuable. It's, it's small things like that, but once you start to do it, you'll see that other people will kind of notice, you know, and they'll start doing it too. Hi, hopefully this isn't too redundant. <laughs> Last question. Um, I also work here at the aquarium. I'm actually one of the interpreters. So every day I'm talking to people about uh, sharks or plastic or acidification or you know the next the next big issue that's uh, affecting the oceans. And it it can be a lot, especially for those of us who do know, I guess how bad it is. And trying to communicate with that with people without being doom and gloom, as you said. Uh, so I guess I'm wondering. I personally like. Do you have a strategy of, I don't know if it's uh, picking a battle for the day or just how do you like kind of keep hope and remember that, you know, it's it, there's so many things we can do as consumers and it's like how do you pick that day how to manage plastic and manage sharks and manage carbon and everything else um, all at the same time. Yeah, yeah, you've got a really good point there. And what Rob would tell you is, instead of fighting against something, remember what you're fighting for, because you'll find inspiration in that. You know, so take a look at something beautiful. You know, you got plenty of beautiful things around here in the aquarium, or go listen to those beautiful smelling sea lions out there bark at you a little bit. You know, and they're just like, oh yeah, that's what I'm all about. That this is this is why I do this. It's because you care deeply about something that is absolutely beautiful and wonderful and magical. So remember that part. Don't remember all the obstacles that are lining up against us. Those things are there for your benefit, not for your detriment. Every obstacle is an opportunity for you to up your game. That's what Robbie would tell you. He'd say, every time that something gets thrown in our path, it's our chance to get up and over this hurdle. And when we do, it's going to be something beautiful on the other side. Something that was really important to Rob and really important to all of us too and really helps me as a conservationist is having a tribe. Having people that are going through it with you and maybe are having a good day when you're having a bad day so that you can kind of talk about some of the issues and really kind of get some support. And definitely, I mean, doom and gloom for sure surrounds us and there's a lot of losses. So, you know, celebrating those small wins, but also having a community around you of people that care about the same thing and understand what you're going through, that was really important. I mean, Rob was definitely our leader in that. I mean, and Brian talked about it too. He had such a sense of eternal optimism and, and just hope. And just being around him and knowing what, I, what he's witnessed, I've been with him and he's been walking through 7,000 dead sharks in a harbor and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, how would you ever bounce back from that? Here's a creature that you're passionate about. And every single time he was able to restore his faith in humanity. So having him around us was just incredibly recharging as a conservationist and now we're that person for each other. And I would definitely say, you know, surround yourself with those types of people and get a community to kind of support you as well. You probably already have it, but definitely it's something very helpful. Okay, hi, sorry. Um, I grew up with the Jacques Cousteau is made me fall in love with the ocean. And about 10 years ago, we bought shark water and watched it and Rob made us fall in love with sharks. Everybody thought we were crazy to the point where we actually have planned, we've done shark dives and we plan, we're planning more shark dives. So my question is, is how, does, how would Rob feel or how did he feel about um, the shark tourism where they're feeding, like baiting sharks to, for the divers? Well, you know, one thing that we always said is, and I recognize the question is, are we changing the behavior of these animals by luring them in with bait and things along those lines? 
Yes, I, I think that we are changing their behavior a little bit, but not nearly as much as throwing them up on the dinner table, you know? So which is the lesser of two evils? It's not a perfect answer, but it does provide an opportunity to make them worth more money alive than they are fished, you know? Because over the course of a shark's lifetime, for instance, in like Palau, it's worth over a million dollars. If you take it to market, it's worth like 35 cents. So, you know, if we're just dealing with math, it makes a whole lot more sense to be able to keep these creatures alive, you know, if we're just looking at it from an economic standpoint. There's obviously a plethora of other reasons to keep these guys on the planet. One is which <laughs> the oxygen we breathe, we're kind of reliant upon them to keep the, the architecture of the ecosystem in place. But again, I can understand why you'd ask that question. And, and does it make it dangerous for sharks? And it does, but not, not compared to the alternative, you know? So I think it's, it's in our best interest to find ways to dive with sharks. And if that means that a shark operation is baiting them, you have to look at how they're doing it. Each one is a little bit different. Some are much more responsible than others. And you, as an experienced shark diver, would know this. You, you choose a good, reputable, and a, a, a conscious dive operation to go with. Yeah, and I guess the, the, the key here is that um, Rob had a very strong belief that even though um, baiting sharks to come to school around the boat so people can see them is not the best way of doing it. When you consider the number of divers I mentioned before is six million and the six and a half million registered divers in the world, it's so important people understand these are not dangerous creatures. And the more people we get in the water with sharks, however we do it, that are not there to kill them, the better it's going to be for all of us. So if we got to put more chum in the water to bring more sharks around so we get more people in the water, then I know Robbie would say, let's do it. Let's teach people these creatures are not to be feared. He used to always joke about the fact people used to say, you know, every time you get someone's diving with great white sharks, they're always in a cage. And he goes, yeah, but who do you think's filming them outside the cage? There's somebody outside the cage with a camera filming them in the cage, and they are not in the cage. <laughs> and they go, oh, oh, that's right. And the reality is sharks are not dangerous. And Rob knew this. In his soul, he knew this. And I think that's what we have to get the message across. Jaws created a paranoia in mankind unlike any, anything else man has ever seen. And for some reason, that has hung on for 40 years. I guess it's 50 years now. It's just way too long. And Peter Benchley, as you know, said he wished he never wrote the book. Mm. I wish Stephen Spielberg would say he wished he never made the movie. Mm. And he hasn't said that, but he should. <laughs> Hi. Hi, so over here again. Um, I just wanted to say that, I, I mean, we all loved Rob's passion, but one of the things that I admired most about him is just when you think he couldn't keep going, he just found it somehow to keep going. When he was in the hospital in the first shark water, you thought, wow, he can't do this anymore, and he pulled through. And so I think when we all heard the news, we were all scared that this second shark water wouldn't make it. Um, but I just wanted to ask you guys, how did you like keep going? How did you find it? Um, it you know. yeah. I think um, you know, for Brian and I and the entire team, it was just something that we had to do. It was maybe a bit like Rob that we just couldn't give up. There were times though that uh, you know, we were looking at uh, challenging issues. But no, we had to keep going. Yeah, I agree with that too. It's, uh, as, as you see him as our example, there's no chance of giving up. You know, that, that's not even in the cards. It's not, it's not a possibility. And uh, he didn't give up either. He continued to direct us from afar and he made sure that this was done. And, he, and it turned out beautiful. So I hope you get a chance to see it. Hi. Whoops, hi. <laughs> um, I was lucky enough to, to meet Rob um, here in Vancouver. I actually met him through uh, his interactions with the group that I was volunteering for, which was a group that was based out of the Chinese community uh, on the so, in, encouraging people and educating people not to, not to choose shark fin at their weddings, etc. And I think it's just always been a really interesting um, aspect of the conversation for me as to how much positivity and... Uh, movement can be made by having that conversation respectfully. And 
I think one thing which really stood out for me about Rob was just how respectful and how passionate he could be without ever getting into that, that angry, that, that, that angry man mentality. And it, it really, for a lot of reasons that, that I admired him, um, that was just the way he approached the whole situation and was able to generate that, that respectful but passionate engagement. And you, you touched on it earlier in terms of saying, well, part of the, the way we, we fix this problem and save sharks is to, is to engage with consumers. And, and what are your thoughts in that? I see quite often the, the whole conversation about shark fin and it, as soon as you get to an online forum and that, that conversation hits like the internet, it becomes a fight. And I feel that's not the way forward. I don't think it's the way that Rob would want it to go forward. And do you have any thoughts or any, any insights on, on how, how he thought about like, making that, that conversation a positive one as opposed to a negative one? Yeah, this is actually a conversation that he and I had regularly uh, because he was a great teacher in that he was able to keep an even keel in the most trying of situations. I kind of would fly off the deep end a little bit more and end up getting angry and pissed off and want to throw somebody off the end of the dock or whatever. And Rob was like, nobody hears you when you're screaming, you know? And, and I've said this before in a couple different uh, circumstances. One of his quotes that stays with me at all times is the greatest weapon that we have in this revolution is the camera, not the shotgun. So we go in with an open heart, with an open mind, and with the sense of love, because love is the only thing that's going to drive this darkness out of our path. You know, it's the only thing that's going to shine light into the cracks, and the only thing that's going to make a difference. If we fight them, they're just going to fight back. So that kind of positivity is rare to find. It's in people like, you know, Martin Luther King and Gandhi and, and Rob Stewart. So, you know, if you can find a way to muster that and keep those kind of folks as your, your inspiration, he is mine and, and I will continue to take this with me wherever we go. Oh, yeah, quick question for you. I, I, I know you, you touched on unraveling uh, the, the food mystery and, and uh, shark content within food. I'm just wondering if you're working with any organization like Seafood Watch uh, that can help get the word out about these, uh, these products uh, through the certification process. Um, I think if the question was working with other groups to spread the messaging, yes. Yeah, Seafood Watch. Rob actually worked with many organizations. He worked with the Pew Foundation, Humane Society, Oceana, um, WWF, um, Lush. It was a long, long uh, collaboration. They've been supporting his research work, uh, you know, since the first shark water. Um, what was the, um, the Ocean Elders? Uh, Richard Branson's um, organization uh, that meet once a year, they're funding uh, work as well. Um, and it's actually tough to do because some of these organizations can be a little bit territorial, but uh, Rob managed to do various things with all of those groups. And it's actually an excellent way to get the messaging out there because some of those groups are, are very, very large. Um, and two of them I know are gonna be pushing this shark fin ban you know, really through the legislature this fall. Uh, Oceana, I think, and HSI, so if you watch out for their work. We're working with them as well in the background, but their membership is really, really useful. You mentioned, uh, you know, working in conjunction with something like Seafood Watch, and, and this brings up one of the big issues and a hot topic in today's kind of marketplace is that Food is often mislabeled, you know? So Seafood Watch is taking it on their shoulders to make sure we know what is sustainable and a viable source of seafood to eat. But now another thing that needs to be addressed in that is that the seafood that's coming to market is labeled properly. So I think that that's something that we can all lean on as consumers towards, you know, an organization like Seafood Watch that comes out of the aquarium in Monterey, or what, what the equivalent of what you guys have here, you know, just to make sure that there's some investigatory action to find out if there is actuality in the labeling of the food that's coming to our markets. 
I think that's going to be one of the next things that we see mm -hmm. that will be spurred on through this movement. Oh, there have been so many good things that have been said here tonight, and I just really want to commend you guys for um, bringing Rob's vision into fruition. This is a story that needs to be told. Um, my connection to shark water is that I'm a diver, so I have dove all over the world. I go every year diving with these amazing animals. Um, it's one of the biggest passions of my life has been diving with these animals, and it's really brought so much positive change to my life. I'm also a realtor. And my team has gotten very active in the Vancouver area cleaning up our beaches. And we've also taken to the waters, going under the water and cleaning up some of this fishing gear that has been left. And um, one of the big goals that we have moving forward is that we want to travel internationally and start taking our com campaign internationally and start cleaning up some of these sites that have been affected by the fishing industry. So through your travels, what have you seen or what areas have you seen that would be in most desperate need of that kind of activism? And secondly, um, one of the great things I love about shark water is that it pushes buttons. So. Um, what are your intentions kind of moving forward with regards to the shark water team to start targeting the fishing industry and bringing them to accountability for some of the practices that they employ, such as long lining and leaving out these long lines that have systematically um, reduced the population of pelagic sharks, such as the oceanic white tip or the silky sharks? Well, the first part of your question are what are some of the communities where you, we think that there's a dire need for this kind of cleanup effort. Indonesia would be like maybe number one in, on my list. Uh, yeah, in Indonesia, in Raja Ampat and, and the areas surrounding like out in Bali, there's a ton of fishing and they've made a lot of strides as far as regulations of what they're doing and, and, and what kind of fishing they're allowing there. But there's still a ton of pirate gear left in the water. So that would be a great place to do it because they've already started to change their governmental policies on how things are allowed in their, their territorial waters, but they need a lot of help because uh, the infrastructure is in such a way that they don't have resource to go out and collect this fishing gear that's left. And it's, as we talked about earlier, just killing everything in its wake. You know, it, Just because it's no longer owned by a certain fisherman does not mean that it's not causing massive damage. So that'd be number one on my list, personally. Um, I would check that out. And I'm sorry, I forgot the second part of the question. Ah, yeah. Gotcha. Well, one particular uh, target that we took into this film was the California drift net fisheries. We've already discussed a billion times tonight, but I can't get it off my brain because today <laughs> is awesome. You know, so there's one massive victory, and we're going to target a lot of other fisheries in its wake. Uh, as you mentioned, longline fishing is an extremely unsustainable way of going about things. Another one of these fisheries that doesn't target any specific species, but just takes everything. So we run across these long lines down in Costa Rica and in Panama and in Ecuador and in Colombia, where there's 60 miles of hooks. You know, so what we got to do is make sure that we get. Alternatives in place, it goes back to the question that the young lady asked here the other day, what's, or just a few moments ago, what's, what's the most important part of this revolution? We've got to do all kinds of things, but we have to find alternatives for the local communities so that they're not simply reliant upon fishing. We have to create grassroots movements of boots on the ground of people that don't want to see this kind of practice happening in their waters any longer. And then we have to use those grassroots movements to push our governments to make policy changes. Then we have to enforce it. So a good way to get it started is make sure that boots on the ground are, are voicing our opinions that this kind of fishing has to stop. Yeah, one of the answers here is, is really to um, look at the fishing industry worldwide and understand that once you get outside those, those territorial waters, it's totally unregulated. You can't stop that until the consumer stops buying the end product. So until we stop the demand for shark and product, we can't stop the long liners taking shark and using it for finning and their liver and everything else they're using it for these days. So that's one issue. The other thing to think about is that there are certain fishing villages around the world right now that no longer can fish because the sharks are gone. The sharks, when they're in an island environment, like Canary Islands, for example, they've been fished out so much by the European Union and basically the Japanese and China, uh, Indonesian fishing vessels and Chinese vessels have come in and wiped out the entire shark species around the Canary Islands. So the Canary Island fishermen 
can no longer catch their fish and live off of fishing. So they're selling sand. They're going into the ocean, digging up buckets of sand, putting it on their head, taking it to a trailer, and selling sand to survive and feed their families. And that's a common practice now in islands around the world because sharks kept the species that the fishermen were usually targeting closer to shore, and their boats could go out and get them. Sharks are gone, so the fish are gone out further and deeper and deeper, and they, they can't be caught anymore. So it's a, this is a fundamental problem in fishing villages around the world. Fishing villages are going bankrupt. They have no way to survive. So what we need to do is show them alternative ways of dealing with this. The first and best one is to get rid of these massive fishing conglomerates that are basically raping our oceans. Now, the only way to stop doing that is to stop the demand. And as long as we're going to continue to consume the kind of fish we're taking out of the oceans in the amounts we are, it's not going to stop. So it's a, it's a really tough scenario. But it starts with all of us. So Rob had a belief, no fishing is the answer. No more fish for a while. Let the oceans recover. Don't have any fish. Stop the sushi. Stop it all. And we have. At least this table has. Most of the fishing in the world happens within the coastal waters of individual countries. And if those individual countries were able to manage those fisheries, uh, we could probably work towards a sustainable you know, fishing industry. We've got 7 billion people on the planet. We're heading toward 9 billion. We have to keep the fish in the water. It's a source of protein for a lot of people. But managing that... But honestly, in most of the world, there's very, very little regulations in terms of fishing. So as long as, you know, people are importing those products, you know, those fishing communities will continue to, you know, fish that resource. Just have a short response to your first question, which is where you should go. And from my perspective, I think you should go somewhere where sharks are protected. So since shark water, 12 million square miles of the oceans have been protected as shark sanctuaries, which is absolutely incredible. And next time someone says one person can't make a difference, yes, they can. They can get 12 million square miles protected um, for shark. I mean, those are the places to start. So Raja Ampat, Indonesia, Cocos, Galapagos, there's amazing places all over the world that definitely still have that fishing gear there and need help. So I think we've almost run out of time, but before we go, I was wondering if um, you on the panel had any last thoughts, last things that you wanted to say um, before we wrap up? Or did all the questions ask everything you wanted? Please see the movie. Please share the message. Please see if you can get as many people as you can out, because you'll see it's a really important message. And you guys know this already. You're the believers. but. Uh, we need more people like you. And thank you. The, the, the next person that's going to go out and change the world is one of you guys. So make sure. You know, I, Rob would always say that once uh, people found out the information that um, he had to share, they were morally bound to then do something about it. And I think we're all morally bound and we're all part of Team Sharkwater. So, Hopefully you guys are gonna join us because we have some very big shoes to fill, which we never will be able to fill, but we're definitely gonna keep carrying on his mission. I mean, that is absolutely, there's so many of us around the world that are really committed and we really need your help doing it. Yeah, that's the one thing I have to say is that uh, when you look at the network around the world that talks about these issues right now, it's getting bigger and bigger every day. Plug into it, be a part of it, and let people know um, that you care about what's going on in the world's oceans and you would be amazed how many other people say, yeah, I do too, but what do I need to do? Well, now you can tell them what they have to do. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for coming. That was extremely fascinating. And thank you all for, as well for coming in and asking such in-depth questions. So thank you very much. I saw it out of the corner of my eye. And the second it made eye contact with me, it freaked out. Things to give out. So we have four tickets. We'll give out two prizes for um, the screening of shark water extinction on September the 30th at 2 p.m. here in Vancouver, plus 
a brilliant hat. Um, so, because I didn't get around to doing something sensible like making a prize draw, I'm going to have um, a little bit of a. Shark water two. Um, is shark finning still happening in Costa Rica? It's a billion dollar industry. There's mafia rings trying to exploit the resource. So we got to watch our back. You have to be careful. There is very bad players. Cars pulled up behind ours. It looks Costa Rican. Sharks are now renamed and fed to us. Pet food, livestock feed, and even in cosmetics. You know, we spent four years trying to figure out what the biggest environmental issues were, only to discover this in our own backyard. There's two Japanese boots. We got to get up there and see. Are they shooting? Yeah, yes. Let's go. Let's go. Go, go, go. go. Five thirteen p.m. Watch standards at Sector Key West Command Center. Received a report of a missing diver. We depend on other species for survival. Removing sharks is removing part of the framework that allows life to exist on land. The only option I have is to not give up. We developed a distrust of humanity at times. We're trying to figure out how we're going to save ourselves. We still have a bright future if we want it, but we've got to do something now. Humanity's gonna rise to the challenge of tackling this. It's gonna be amazing to see.